Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbert brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Good evening, friends, and welcome to this May 20, 2014 edition of Nightcast. Tonight, the lead story, we open with the a story from the Ukraine where Ukraine drivers hold horn protest. This is a new, very noisy strategy by those who are against what is happening here in eastern Ukraine at the moment. They are angry at the political separatism. They're angry at the attempts to secede from Ukraine. And they're angry at the pro-Russian armed groups roaming through the streets of this region and they're determined to vent that anger. Now this whole thing had been planned to be a peaceful rally in the city of Mariupol, a couple of hours drive from here in Donetsk yesterday, Monday, tens of thousands planning to take part, but it had to be called off at the last minute because of threats by those armed pro-Russia groups to attack the protest march. So now we've had a call by Metinvest, a big steel company here, the largest firm in Ukraine, which is headquartered here in Donetsk that every day at 12 noon, people should come out in their cars, sound their horns, and show their dissatisfaction with what is happening. These are people who are determined to take part in the presidential election this Sunday, determined to be part of a united Ukraine, the other side, as to what we've seen up until now from those pro-separatist groups. And they're determined to have their voices and their car horns heard. And friends, uh as Mark Lowen was saying there about people determined to have their voices, and in this case, their car horns heard as well, the war of words over the crisis in Ukraine has deepened after the country's interim prime minister accused Russia of wanting to start World War III. Now, I'm going back to our archive just a few weeks, back to April 25 for this story. Smoke billows over an eastern Ukrainian airbase. This is unverified footage. There have been reports of a military helicopter being hit by a rocket propelled grenade. Whatever this is, it's likely to add to the sudden new escalation in tensions here. And armed pro Russian activists seemingly very much back in charge outside the eastern Ukrainian town of Slavyansk, a day after short lived Ukrainian army raids raised the political and diplomatic temperature in this tense standoff another significant notch. The Americans are laying the blame for images like these more squarely than ever at Russia's door. This is a full throated effort to actively sabotage the democratic process through gross external intimidation Russia has put its faith friends I want to come over the Secretary of State United States Secretary of State for just a moment to point out that what I really want you to hear is at the end of this April 25 2014 story with the Prime Minister but as the diplomatic war of words intensifies Russia's Foreign Minister has hit back with some accusations of his own the West and this is how it all began wants to seize control of the Ukraine because of its own political ambitions, not the interest of the Ukrainian people. Just what the Ukrainian military's raids have really achieved is unclear. They certainly angered Moscow enough for it to order new military. I want you to hear the Prime Minister. One report within a acting Prime Minister of the Ukrainian border of Ukraine. What he says right here at the end. This from Ukraine's interim Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk. Attempts at Russian military aggression on the territory of Ukraine will cause military conflict in the European area, he told a cabinet meeting. And Russia already wants to start the Third World War, he said. With no apparent resolution to the standoff on the ground, does all this bring a direct confrontation between Ukraine and Russia closer? And if so, what will the international fallout be? Nick Childs, BBC News. Thank you, Nick Childs, from again, from Nick Childs from April 25 this year with the uh, interim prime minister of Ukraine asking the question, is Russia trying to start World War III? That's what he believes. Uh, is uh, Let me go back and get my notes on uh, exactly. 
He says uh, he's accused Russia of wanting to start World War III. And friends, I've been making a few comments about last night's news about how if you do, if you missed last night's news, please go back in our archive. And even though I understand my microphone may have been a little bit hot in a few places, we're trying to get our knobs adjusted just right on our compressors and. Maybe I can get a new compressor that has little notches you can set that'll, that'll keep it in the right place for us, no matter where our other levels and volumes go. But still, last night's program shows you several of the worst ever in history items uh, regarding flooding, regarding disease epidemics, regarding wildfires, regarding famine, famine in the Sudan, flooding in the drought-stricken United States with the worst drought ever now in the United States and several other countries suffering that same fate that's caused conditions that allowed the wildfires burning wildly out of control in San Diego County to ignite a couple of weeks ago and still continuing as there were new evacuation notices just yesterday in the news, and then the cholera outbreak follow, uh, it, uh, associated and alongside the famine in the Sudan. That news coming out yesterday. At the same time, within the past week, news coming out of, of the MERS disease epidemic, MERS standing for the acronym for ME Middle East RS Respiratory Syndrome, MERS Middle East Respiratory Syndrome with that for a while having been isolated to deaths in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, but now we've had some people who've traveled from there to the United States bring that over here. And we give you details about how the agricultural ministry of Saudi Arabia accused camels of carrying that disease, and they told people to be sure and boil your milk camel's milk and cook your camel meat before you eat it. We showed you scriptures that go to uh, the clean and unclean meats chapters in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that explicitly, expressly, God says, don't eat the camel, it's unclean, and that don't drink its milk. If you can't eat the meat, you can't drink the milk. It's all unclean for human consumption. Little baby camels, yeah, they can drink that milk, but not humans. And so no wonder people are getting sick from crazy, wild disease viruses that get into humans and then spread from human to human. But uh, the Ukraine crisis, could it kick off World War III? Could these worse-than-ever situations with related to famine, relating, related to disease epidemics, related to drought, related to wildfires... What am I missing? Whatever else was in last night's news, friends. Could all that relate to an acceleration of these first four seals? And, of course, you got your white horse with religious deception and Christ saying, many will come in my name, saying that, in fact, I, Jesus, am indeed the Christ, but nonetheless deceiving many by their false teachings and the Roman Catholic Church getting more and more popular, the church that provides the Pope who holds the coronation ceremonies for the crowning of the emperors of the Roman Empire. And when the Pope crowns an emperor of the Roman Empire, it's then called the Holy Roman Empire, even though it's some of you might recognize it as rather unholy because of it being part of the world's religion that is affiliated with the world's God, who is, was Lucifer turned Satan, turned rebel to the creator of the whole universe, God the Father and his son, the Word, who became Jesus Christ. Um, so you may see it as an unholy uh, union of church and state, and indeed it is, but it's called the Holy Roman Empire. And there's one more revision of it, run more revival of it yet to come. While we're on that subject, let's just throw this chart up on the screen for a moment. But let me just pull this in for a second and say, look, 
When these first four seals accelerate, Jesus Christ told us in Matthew 24, going to verse 32, he says, when you see the branches of the fig tree become tender and it begin to sprout leaves, then you know, hey, we're in the, we're in the what do you call it, the uh, spring has sprung, spring is busting out all over. Let me see if I can get this music on the screen a little bit, I, I, you know, uh, behind me while I, uh, I see, what can I play this with? Let's try, let me try this one right here. Let's see if we can get that music up. Oops, wrong, wrong, wrong. Oh, I don't want to trigger YouTube's uh, content ID. I'm sorry, YouTube. I hit the, hit the wrong button there. I meant to hit uh, this one over here that we don't have to worry about licensing on this music. Um, yeah, I ought to be able to play it with this one. This relates to what I'm saying to you a little bit, friends, and adds a little bit of nice, maybe, liveliness to our program. Let's see if we can get Jane McKee playing on the big pipe organ. Uh, Jane, where are you there, sweetheart? There she is. Okay. When you see the acceleration of these first four seals, it, it's, it's like, friends, like Christ said in verse 32 of Matthew 34. When the fig tree's branches become tender and the leaves begin to spring forth, it's like spring busting out all over. And you can see it, you know, uh, it, it, when you see these things activate so that they're the worst ever in history, then we can know the next major event in prophecy. We can know, as Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong said, the next major event in prophecy, it's nigh. I don't know if it's at the door quite yet, but it's close. It's nigh. This Friend, I, you know, I couldn't say it anymore. I couldn't stick my neck out anymore. I don't think I'm sticking my neck out that far to say it could happen this summer. We could find ourselves in a situation where Christ gathers us, some of us. He, events accelerate so that the fifth seal comes together. What happens during this fifth seal? During this fifth seal, the Great Tribulation, a number of things occur. One is United Europe comes together. World War III is, is, is started. The, war, the largest, biggest epidemic of uh, martyrdom of saints occurs. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, a time as Jesus Christ described it, so bad it's worse than any other trouble or that man has ever known since the beginning of mankind, and is so bad that there will never, ever, ever again be a time so bad as what will occur and happen during this time that Christ refers to as Jacob's trouble, a time when especially the Israelite nations will be troubled and they'll be taken captive and many of them killed. Uh, during this time, as Ezekiel and Jeremiah explain, a third of the people of the world will be killed by war, by the red horse. Another third of the population of the world will be killed by the next two horses, the black horse and the pale horse, the famine and the horse, the pale horse whose rider is named Death. And they'll be killed by loimus, disease epidemics, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt. They'll be killed by seismic conditions, seismus, commotions in the air, gale force winds of all kinds, commotions on the ground, earthquakes and the like, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, etc. and so on. And terricade, trouble, just general trouble that will accelerate to the point we get into the great trouble, the great tribulation, the mega trouble, the great tribulation, seal number five. That's next. And friends, how much worst ever stuff is it going to take before Jesus Christ says, Hey, dummies out there, my brethren, my elect, you first fruits, you spring harvest. As Mr. Armstrong used to say to you, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Get your act ready. Be ready to have your take off your hiking boots and put on your parachute and be ready to flee this great tribulation coming. That's next. Some of you may say, oh, Steve, you're getting awfully excited. Well, friends, I doesn't, how many times do we have to see something as the worst ever in history before we start to say, ah, oh, I think I should be awake to what's going on around here. 
Something's going on. You better believe it's going on. And if, friends, if I don't get a little bit excited as one of the least of the ordained ministers, but if, if I don't want any of the brethren out there who've been able to see my programs that we do as a service to say, God, you didn't give me any warning. Nobody got excited about what's happening in the news. Nobody said, hey, listen to this worst ever in history stuff. Nobody got excited. Well, excuse me, God just might pull up this video and say, uh, friends, you heard Stephen. Why didn't you get on your knees, start doing a little more fasting than you've been doing? If you've been, and if you haven't been doing any at all, it's a good time to pull out a fast once in a while. You know, it might even be a good time to fast once every week. Some of us do good if we're fasting once a month, once a year at the annual Day of Atonement. Friends of the news, I, you know, we need to be awake. Our Father, He loves us. And I, I ask Him before I come on these programs, when I open my mouth, God, you please fill it. And uh, listen, I, I know, we all know, Mr. Armstrong stuck his neck out a few times and said, hey, it would happen in, in a few years. But you know, we're at a point where uh, what's happening right now, if Mr. Armstrong were alive to see this, you think I maybe got a little excited tonight? You just, you just wait till you see how Mr. Armstrong would have reacted. And if God should, as Jeff Nielsen sometimes has suggested, if God does resurrect Mr. Armstrong, you know, there will be a lot of people, I'm sad to say, who have rejected Mr. Armstrong's writings in the mystery of the ages. They have old groups. They ignore what he says. He, they say, he says, don't vote for your leaders. we got whole big groups who voted in their leaders or allow their ministers to vote in their leaders. And, and, and so can these people be trusted to be telling you when we need to be urgent about things? They ignore Mr. Armstrong. If Mr. Armstrong, if God resurrected and then he came back, would he go visit these groups? Seeing that many of them have ignored his writings, he might be well likely to say, hey, they're not listening to me. Why should I show my face up there? God's giving me just so much opportunity to go here or there and say, brethren, this is it. Be ready. Be over here at a certain time and be ready to flee, however it's going to happen. I don't know yet, folks, but it could be awfully soon because the news stories, please review last night's if you didn't see it. The worst ever, floods, famines, disease epidemics, drought, you know, things are getting there, dear friends. They're getting there. And like the interim prime minister of, uh, in the report with Nick Childs, as he asked the question or made the comment, you know, is Russia getting ready to start World War III? And, you know, round three of World War is going to be one that Jesus Christ will have to intervene in because during the last war, World War, we didn't have hydrogen bombs. Yes, the United States used a couple of atomic bombs, but the atomic bomb is only the trigger for the hydrogen bomb, which was developed and exploded in August 1955. And when a generation used to be described as 20 years, that made Mr. Armstrong believe, well, 1975, there was one point when he thought 1975 would be the time Christ had to return because that was the first time in history man could annihilate himself and this generation would Christ said in Matthew 24 around verse uh, 20 21 he said uh, and except let me back up uh, I want to read verses 21 and 22 to you real quick but he uh, he said a little bit earlier or maybe it's later in the chapter that uh, this generation shall not pass until all these things uh, have happened. All right, I got to nail that down exactly where that was because when I want to go to that, I need to be able to flip to it. It may be in Luke 21 where he says that part, but let me just read you verses 21 and 22 first, and then maybe we'll take a few moments and go on over to Luke 21. Verse 21 of Matthew 24 says, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And verse 22, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved alive. Alive, as the Moffat version correctly puts it, 
But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. In World War II, the weapons of mass destruction of the annihilation of mankind did not exist. They do now. They do to the uh, point of multi the world could be, mankind could be annihilated multiple times because of the overkill that exists with nuclear stockpiles. And this time, once the next round of world war starts, people like, well, you see how Vladimir Putin in uh, Russia is not backing down over the situation where they feel they've got rights to the Russian-speaking people in the Ukraine. You see how China is not backing down against the claims of both Japan and Vietnam over those islands in the South China Seas. And we've got to get to a story tonight related to that. China, well, China's buddying up with Russia because of that, uh, the news story today says, because of that South China Sea situation. China is adamant that those islands and that sea territory around the islands belong to them. Vietnam is adamant it belongs to them. Japan is adamant it belongs to them. The United States has sided up with Japan. And friends, you know, uh, our leaders in the United States, are they thinking? Our biggest, the, United, the biggest creditor of the United States is China. I mean, do you stick your, no, uh, your, your thumb up the nose of your biggest creditor? No, your creditor has, he can call the chips on you. And China is the biggest creditor of the, what's the word to use for big time spender United States with no, practically no debt ceiling. They just, the president keeps putting pressure on the opponents of raising the debt ceiling and makes them raise it every time. He just makes them keep raising it, you know. As if there's no, as if the sky is the limit. But uh, let me just quickly see if in Luke 21, I can not embarrass myself too much and see if we can put our finger on the verse where it says, uh, where it says, this generation shall not pass till all these things. Um, I tell you what, I know. I don't know how to quickly find it. We can quickly do this if I'm, you know, since I've gone into this this much this so far. Let me pull up an electronic Bible. We can bring it up that way. And some of you, look, if you if you've got it before I got it, terrific, great for you. But when I'm doing a live program, the brain sometimes doesn't work as well. Let's see, what are we looking for? We're looking for the verse that says, "This generation." not pass. That ought to bring it up. It's Matthew 24, 34. I just didn't go far enough. If you go over to verse 34 in Matthew 24, let's go there real quick. I know I'm going to make us run over time, you know, but friends, look, we may not be on here very much longer. If God's going to wrap this thing up, unless he decides you and me, you know, the combination of some of us need more time, and he may have given us all, he, say, he may be saying, look, folks, that's the limit. I've given you 10, 20 extra years for all of you to pull it together. He, he may say, enough. Uh, we're not delaying this any longer. Things are there. If he doesn't delay it any longer, friends, there's no way it cannot close up this year the way news is going. Verse 34, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things fulfilled. And God gave the understanding to Mr. Herbert Armstrong to understand that one of all these things related to verses 21 and 22 that says, Except those days be shortened, no man should, no flesh should be saved alive. We're now at that point if World War III begins. Uh, with so much stockpile and nobody wanting to give in, uh, Germany had to give in a couple of times. They ran out of am ammunition. But this time, friends, Germany will have its hands on nuclear weaponry that the United States created because we're storing it. The United States is storing it in Germany. And Germany, all it takes is a little leg up 
grab that stuff, run the United States out of there. The United States is already in trouble because of spying accusations and listening in on cell phones. And instead of the president saying, I'm sorry, Germany, but, you know, we went to bat for you at, in, after World War I when the other nations came up with the Treaty of Versailles, and we did not sign the Treaty of Versailles because we thought what the other nations were requiring of you, Germany, were too oppressive, too extreme. Then following World War II, when Germany was, again, when it uh, un unconditionally surrendered, and, German and Berlin was split up between the four allies of France, the United States, the Great Britain, then Great Britain, and Russia. And Russia put a big, uh, a big wall through there and left that wall there for a long time that divided East and West Berlin. The United States was instrumental, was prominent in calling for the bringing down of that wall. The United States helped Germany rebuild with the Marshall Plan. The United States helped the German economy with the purchase of hundreds of thousands of Volkswagens in the United States, passing a lot of the United States money to the German economy by the purchases of those little Beatles, V-dubs, you know. And uh, instead of buying American-made cars, everybody had to have those Beatles. Walt Disney even made a famous movie about the Beatle. And then the United States helps Chicago, Illinois especially, helped promote the coinage and the success, even through its rough times, still it's still alive, the euro. The, they promoted the euro, a money which, is de uh, which has as a goal, an unwritten goal, but a goal nonetheless, of replacing the dollar as the world reserve currency and as replacing the Yankee dollar as the petro currency. Uh-huh. <clears throat> All of this working to the demise of the United States and yet foolish leaders of the United States encourage and promote these things that will work against the United States and in favor of Germany and ultimately, and they kissed the... I started this statement, how do I finish it? And they, 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 uh, they brown-nosed the leaders of Germany after Germany's upset because the United States NSA was listening in on their cell phone conversations. If I were the leader of the United States, I would say, Germany, we're going to do more than listen to your cell phone conversations. We're going to require you to place reports. Uh, yeah. Well, I need some time to give that some thought, friends. But I would, uh, I would suggest and recommend the United States do far more than listen in on cell phone conversations of the leaders of Germany. I would say, look, we've got two big reasons to not trust you. One reason is World War I. Second reason is World War II. And I think you could put a third reason in there, too. And that is that uh, there's an underground Nazi uh, organization and there's a tone in Germany that is lending itself toward a world war, a round three of world war. And there's more than that, friends. Even God himself says he will use the Assyrians to punish Jacob. That'll be part of Jacob's trouble. God himself opening up the fifth seal, the great tribulation, even though it'll be tribulation that's not caused by God, It'll be tribulation of, that's caused by Satan. If you look at the headline at the top of these seals, this says the, the prophetic seals of Revelation 6. Above that, it says the days of man and, not God, but Satan. The days of man and Satan. Satan, of course, being the God of this world. But the great tribulation is trouble caused by Satan. But God opens that door. God says, okay, now it's time for the fifth seal. He's been holding that back, holding it back, delaying it, dear friends, for many of the, the sake of many of you who watch this program, who are brethren of, let's just say, who are the elect, who are part of the first fruit, part of the spring harvest, the saints, the true saints, who don't need the Pope to say you're a saint just because a saint is one who has God's Holy Spirit 
who's been called and chosen by God and who follows the lead of God's Holy Spirit. Now, friends, I've already gone over time, and I've only covered a couple of our news stories today, and I've got several more. I went over time last night. But, you know, I, we do allow ourselves on occasion to turn this half-hour program into an hour program. And as long as I don't bore too many of you too badly, I hope instead of boring you, I hope I'm shaking some of you up to say, uh, 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 Stephen, well, you know, you got me all scared and frightened. Well, I hope so. I hope it'll drive you to your knees and say, God, are you about to wrap this up this year, this summer even? Uh, are you about to escalate things? And I guarantee you, friends, if you don't have your parachute on, if you've still got your, 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 your only got your hiking boots on, or you're still laying in your bed where you need to wake up, you're gonna miss, you're gonna miss the flight. I was gonna say miss the boat, but it's not gonna be a float. It's gonna be a flight. God says He prepares a great eagle on which we fly and escape to a place of nourishment protection, final training, we've called it safety for a long time, in the wilderness, in an area that triangulates where Jordan is, where Petra is, where more than Petra is, but where Petra is. And as Mr. Herbert Armstrong says, the place of protection where his saints, those who are accounted worthy, those who have a Philadelphia attitude and approach, will go will be in that tri triangulation that includes Petra and may or may not be Petra. So I'm going to try edging my mic back a little bit. See him pecking the needle once in a while, and maybe my mic's a little bit too hot. So maybe we can find out where to adjust that volume control and get it right for you. Because I don't think what's going to happen is going to happen overnight. It's going to be a period of a few weeks, a few months. And yes, God could slow it down and make it be a few years. But right at this moment, if he doesn't slow it down, friends, it's coming. I'll just stick my neck out, and even though I may lose credibility with some of you over saying that, I'm going to say it. If he doesn't slow news events down, it's coming. And you'd better get it, and you should be, you should be doing like I'm doing with you. The few of you that listen with, to me, the friends that you have who listen to you, you should be telling them. You know, you better have your act ready. If God doesn't slow down world news events the way they're going right now, this thing's going to wrap up this year. Now, we don't know the day or the hour, but we do know, as Christ said in, I think it's verse 34 of Matthew 24, where he talks about the fig tree. He says that, that um, I'm going to go for that. We're going to stay with Scripture just another minute, and then we'll finish up these news stories. Um, you know, I had that earlier. The fig tree, um, all right, I'm going to depend on my electronic concordance once, once again. And the, uh, the branches of the tree, when they become tender and the leaves begin to spring forth, all right, I used the wrong words in that. Um, then, uh, then know that summer is nigh. Okay, Matthew 20, verse 32. I got really close. You know, when you're live, it's hard to do this and look at a camera, too. It's a little easier if you have a live audience in front of your face. But Matthew 24, verse 32. Why don't you take a look at that in your own Bible? Verse 32, it says, Now learn a lesson, or learn a parable, an illustration of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Duh, just like that song, you know. Spring is busting out all over. You know when spring is busting out all over. Well, the EU, the fifth seal, is now busting out all over. And it could come together this summer, and an, and an event could trigger that thing, which they're not going to get along, and so there's going to be a climate. Five of iron, five of miry clay. Clay and iron don't mix. They won't get along. There's going to be a climate that of friction between them. And so some event that will cause them all to unite, in spite of that normal friction of iron and clay not mixing, that will cause them to give their power to an emperor who the Pope will 
crown and a coronation ceremony in Frankfurt, Germany. I say in Frankfurt, Germany because that's where all the past emperors have been crowned in a coronation ceremony by the Pope in Frankfurt, Germany, in the Emperor's Hall. And yes, that hall was blown up at the end of World War II by the Allied bombers, but guess what? I've told you this before on this program, and maybe some of you know it too. The United States, through the Marshall Plan, helped rebuild that Emperor's Hall to the architectural specifications that it once had. They, they built it to uh, uh, symmetrically in every way. They built it to resemble the old hall, but even more modernly, even even with newer, better construction. They, they made it even better than it was. There's a new Emperor's Hall all set and ready to go for what's described. Let me zoom in on it. Where's that shot where we zoom in on this thing? On the bottom row down here. It's all set to go for the very bottom, for the seventh head with the ten horns, the one that yet is of Revelation 17:10, the head that is yet to come, to be revived out of the pit, the seventh head, the final head of the Holy Roman Empire. And those, those ten horns that are mentioned here, Let's come back out for a moment. Let's see if we can go over to the other side of the bottom couple rows or just go to the bottom couple rows. Uh, they are the ten toes, the five toes of the east, the five toes of the west of Daniel 2. And they're the tenth horn of Daniel 7. They are the seventh and last horn of uh, Revelation 13. They are the seventh head with the ten horns of Revelation 17. And, and that, friends, that's what we have to expect. That's what's coming. That's what God revealed to Mr. Herbert Armstrong when he revealed to him the sixth head ridden by the woman in the upper row of these two rows. One is, and one's yet to come, the one that is was the sixth head that God revealed to Mr. Herbert Armstrong back way back in 1936 when Mr. Armstrong was 44 years old. He revealed to him that this Mussolini guy and Hitler to follow him are the seventh, are the sixth head. Are, is, are, they are the sixth head of this revived Holy Roman Empire. It even hit the newspapers with Mussolini saying once he conquered Ethiopia that the Holy Roman Empire had been revived. Mr. Armstrong was able to see that and realize that 1710 was a prophecy for his day, our day, these end times. Mr. Armstrong died in 1945. So did uh, the, the uh, now Mr. Armstrong died in 1986, but in 1945, the sixth head of the Roman Empire went into abyss. It went into the pit. Mussolini died. Hitler died. That was the end of the sixth head of the Roman Empire. There's one yet to come, the seventh head. That's going to come in our day, dear friends. And so we should be alert to it because that Roman Empire that triggers off the uh, the emperor, the head of that, that the pope will crown in a coronation ceremony in Frankfurt, Germany, that will kick off the fifth seal, the great tribulation that you see pictured here over in the fifth col column. That could, again, friends, I'm sticking my neck out, I know, but that could happen this summer. All right, now, go on to some of the stories from today's news that... Uh, I have to cover for you just a couple more stories that are very relative to to this um, to this um, uh, coming together of the EU. Uh, you know, I just caught my attention, even though my next story is about China, but this Ukraine sign that says USA plus EU, go home, hands off from Ukraine. You know, interestingly, I'll pull that closer where you can see that that ending frame from that last video. Interesting that those people we claim to be helping and want to be helping, look what they're saying to us. USA, go home. EU, go home. 
there's going to be a point where the EU will be against the United States. So the USA and EU, even though they've got them together there, uh, they're, they're not hand in glove, and the, uh, the EU will ultimately be the United States' worst ever enemy, enemy, enemy. All right, now, let's go to our story that I have for his friends. Uh, the next story is out of China, and I've got uh, I got my notes ahead of myself here. Let me uh, let me see if I can find my place. We've got the story about Putin's hopes for the China summit. Russia's Vladimir Putin. You remember yesterday we told you how he went to China trying to trying to firm up a deal for. Uh, selling the gas that they usually sell to Europe to sell it to China. You'll see in this story how China wants relations with Russia, and yet it wants them, it still wants them in China's to, uh, favor. Uh, but it wants favor with Russia, China does, because of this situation in the South China Seas over those islands that are in dispute between China and Japan and between China and Vietnam. And the United States has sided up with uh, Japan. If Russia and China really side up together, that just deepens the split between the United States and Russia. We don't have, we don't have to rush, worry, though. Mr. Armstrong, God inspired Mr. Armstrong to see a long time ago, the United States doesn't have to worry about being blown up by Russia. It has to be worried about being blown up, taken captive by the sword of Assyria when Assyria, Germany, heads United Europe, as it will and possibly even by this summer, the way news stories are going. Again, God could slow it down, and he will have to slow it down, friends, if it doesn't come together this year. Now, both, all right, we'll calm it down for the rest of the night. Both China and Russia are looking to each other for support. In the face of criticism from the West and territorial disputes, but China could use Russia's troubles in Europe. Oh, you're going to hear, they're going to say that. John Sudworth, let me let you say that in this report, BBC report that uh, John Sudworth has put together. Other than the unusually tight security, the summit, the fourth such meeting of Asian leaders, might not be all that noteworthy. But the timing of it and China's hosting of it mean there's a little more at stake. In particular, this man's attendance will be closely watched. Very much feeling the cold shoulder of Western diplomacy of late, might this be a chance for him to seek the shelter of China's warm embrace? On the eve of the summit, President Putin was quoted by Chinese state media as saying that cooperation between Russia and China has reached the highest level in all its centuries-long history, and speaking of a truly exemplary collaboration which should become a model for major world powers. So this is a summit in which the body language and presentation matter. In fact, China's investing a great deal in its success, pretty much shutting down Shanghai, blocking roads and ordering schools and businesses home for the day. But despite the sense of warming ties and a shifting world order, you can be pretty certain that behind the scenes, some of the old tensions will be lurking. The summit, meant to be all about enhancing security in Asia, comes amid the rising tensions over China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. Its recent deployment of an oil rig in disputed waters led to violent riots in Vietnam. And while Chinese-Russian relations certainly look strong, Xi Jinping made Moscow his first foreign destination after becoming president, some observers suggest China might use Russia's troubles over Ukraine to its advantage. With its European gas market suddenly under threat, there's talk that Moscow, after years of negotiation, is now ready to sign a deal on pumping gas to China. But there's talk, too, that China is using that desperation to drive an even harder bargain. Amid this city's tight security, the efforts to strengthen wider regional security may prove harder than the public pronouncements suggest. 
John Sudworth, BBC News, Shanghai. Thank you, John Sudworth. Friends, in our next story, I don't have video for it. I'm going to have to read it to you, but it's an extremely important story. In this picture, you can see here the FBI has issued a wanted poster for the five Army officers pictured here. China has denounced the U.S. charges against five of its Army officers accused of economic cyber espionage. Beijing says the U.S. is also guilty of spying on other countries, including China, and accuses the U.S. of hypo hypocrisy, hypocrisy and double standards. China has summoned the U.S. ambassador in Beijing over the incident. It says relations will be damaged. U.S. prosecutors are not too wise to damage relations with your leading creditor when you want to keep rise, raising your debt ceiling. U.S. prosecutors say the officers, I'm going to pull their picture forward again in this wanted poster, these officers, uh, I'm not saying this, friends, I'm saying the U.S. prosecutors say the officers stole trade secrets and internal documents from five companies and a labor union. The BBC's John Sudworth, who you just saw in the last video report from Shanghai, says it is extremely unlikely that any of the accused will ever be handed over to the U.S. China's defense ministry put out a strongly worded statement on its website earlier today saying that China's government and its military had never engaged in any cyber espionage activities. It also took aim at the U.S. saying, for a long time the U.S. has possessed the technology and essential infrastructure needed to conduct large-scale system, large systematic cyber thefts and surveillance on foreign government leaders, businesses, and individuals. This is a fact which the whole world knows. Quote, the U.S. deceitful nature and its practice of double, double standards when it comes to cybersecurity have long been exposed from the WikiLeaks incident to the Edward Snowden affair. End of quote there. And friends, in this next picture here, you see the two countries' defense ministers who met just last month. China always insists it's a victim of hacking, not a perpetrator. And when U.S. intelligent contractor Edward Snowden appeared in Hong Kong a year ago with evidence of U.S. hacking into Chinese networks, Beijing felt vindicated. The U.S. acknowledges that it conducts espionage, but says unlike China, it does not spy on foreign companies and pass what it finds to its own companies. Beijing typically shrugs this off as a smear motivated by those who find its growing technological might hard to bear. But to see five named officers of the People's Liberation Army indicated by a U.S. grand jury or indicted by a U.S. grand jury is not something that can be brushed aside so easily. China has already announced the suspension of cooperation with the U.S. on an Internet working group. And once it has said uh, and once it has had time to digest the loss of face, it's likely, China is likely to consider more serious retaliation. The defense ministry added that China's military had been the target of many online attacks and, quote, a, a fair number, end quote, of those had been launched from American IP addresses. China said the arrest of the five Chinese army officers had 
severely damaged mutual trust. A report today from China stated that between March and May this year, a total of 1.18 million computers in China were directly controlled by 2,077 machines in the United States via Trojan horse or zombie malware. Chinese Assistant Foreign Minister lodged a solemn representation within U.S. Ambassador or, or with U.S. Ambassador Max Baucus last night, Monday night. He reported U.S. losses on Monday. U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder said a grand jury had laid hacking charges against the Chinese nationals, the first against known state actors for infiltrating U.S. commercial targets by cyber means. He identified the alleged victims as Westinghouse Electric, Westinghouse Electric U.S. Steel, Alcoa Incorporated, Allegheny Technologies, um, Solar World, and the U.S. Steelworkers Union. The alleged hacking appears to have been conducted for no reason other than to advantage state-owned companies and other interests in China at the expense of businesses here in the United States, Mr. Holder said. In the indictment brought in the Western District of Pennsylvania, the heart of the U.S. steel industry, the U.S. named Wang, Wang Dong, Sun Weiling, Wen Zinyu, Huang Zinyu, and Gu Gunghui, all officers in Unit 61398 of the Chinese People's Liberation Army, PLA, as the alleged conspirators. FBI officials said the hacking between 2006 and 2014, quote, caused significant losses, end quote, at the companies and that there were and that they were like there were likely to be many more victims. Last year, cyber defense company Mundiant published a report on a Chinese military unit the firm said was behind the vast majority of significant attacks on your American federal agencies and companies. In March, Defense Secretary Chuck, Chuck Hagel said the Pentagon planned to more than triple its cyber security capabilities in the next few years to defend against such Internet attacks. And in summary, friends, a unit of China's People's Republic's army to whose uh, Shanghai address U.S. cybersecurity firm Mandiant says it traced a prolific hacking team. The team was said to have hacked into 141 computers across 20 industries, stealing hundreds of, of uh, terabytes of data. Mandiant says the team would have been staffed by hundreds, possibly thousands of proficient English speakers. China said Mandiant's report was flawed and lacked proof. Friends, I have one story to close with, and then we'll be wrapping up a one-hour evening report for this May 20, 2014. And in, in our final report, this is from Egypt. The uh, Egypt election is said to be not a fair fight. A warm welcome for Hamdine Sabahi, underdog in Egypt's presidential race. The seasoned politician works the crowd in one of his strongholds, the city of Banha. He's reaching out to the youth, saying he'll carry on their unfinished revolution. Sabahi came third in the last presidential election in 2012, when voters chose the Islamist Mohamed Morsi. 
The former political prisoner says the Egyptian people have toppled two presidents in recent years, but have seen no benefits from the change. He promised no one would go to sleep hungry if he's elected. But look what he's up against. The front-runner, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, is hugely popular and he's already getting the presidential treatment from the Egyptian media. The former army chief commands more airtime and more deference than his left-wing rival. He told us it's an unfair contest, but he won't leave the fray. To get a real democracy in this country, we have to fight huh? to capture a piece of democracy. I'm not idealist huh, to think that it's a fair election. It isn't, huh? but also I'm not idealist to stay in my home waiting huh, the paradise of democracy to come. Well, Hamdine Sabahi is leaving now thronged by supporters. He's had a very enthusiastic reception here. He has a loyal following. Many see him as the champion of the poor. But he and his supporters know that in this election, they have a tough fight ahead. Then it was off to another campaign stop. Hamdine Sabahi denies this is mission impossible, but that's certainly how it looks. Orla Guerin, BBC News, Vanha, north of Cairo. Thank you, Orla. Friends, uh, for closing tonight, I have a very interesting 60-second outline of the Thailand martial law crisis. Now, I won't be able to play the, we don't have the license to play the music that's underneath this video, so I want to be sure we don't get a content ID problem from YouTube, so we're going to, um, as we put this there for archive for some of you that watch it, this program there. I'm going to be sure our audio is cut off, but it's got, it's got uh, verbiage on the screen, text on the screen that you can see and understand, and I'll, I'll put some kind of licensable music underneath myself as we play this very interesting 60-second outline of the Thailand martial law crisis. Okay, that 60-second uh, video was produced by Marshall, um, well, let me get this right, because he does such a fabulous job with these little 60-second outlines. I appreciate them, appreciate them very much. The video was produced by Michael Hurst. He's done many of these that we've shared with you here, friends. He, he does these for the BBC. And uh, that Thailand, we're going to be watching Thailand because Thailand's been an important figure. Uh, an important country related to the work God's been did for many many years a work that continues by way of preserved recordings of Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong who had good relations with the king and queen of Thailand they visited the headquarters for the Church of God in Pasadena after they hosted guested Mr. Armstrong and his assistant Aaron Dean in the country of Thailand several times and they we had some cooperative workings going there friends that's all the time for doing a one-hour report tonight thank you for joining me i hope we've motivated you edified you with tonight's program stirred you up a little bit hopefully even keep watching the news very important we'd be watching and praying about events in world news closer and closer to that fig tree sprouting not only its leaves but completely budding into the fifth seal the great tribulation Perhaps, perhaps this year. 
God willing, the creek don't rise. We'll be back again tomorrow night, Wednesday night, with our next edition of the day's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, your host Stephen Lloyd Gilbert saying so long. Friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.